Okay, I'll make a start. Uh, all right, hello everybody. Um, my name is Eddie Boyle and uh, I'm a software engineer and web developer um, based at the um, University of Edinburgh. And um, I'm gonna talk quickly about um, what I was doing uh, during the lockdown. Um, now back in April, uh, I had some time to myself, just like everybody else did. Uh, so I was looking online and on social media um, about all the graphs, charts, and uh, data visualizations that, that were uh, about um, the, pan the pandemic. And, um, whoops, my slides are zooming through at super speed and they shouldn't be doing that. Um, right, uh, yes, so um, there, were, there, were, there were an awful lot of um, graphics and uh, visualizations about the pandemic around, and most of these visualizations were in the in were line charts, bar charts, and they were showing that the spread of the, the spread of the virus globally. Um, some of them were doing it through space in terms of what countries uh, were exposed to the virus and which countries were. Uh, having cases and fatalities, and they were things like the standard line. Uh, line graphs, um, but there wasn't many visualizations which um, combined both of these approaches. Um, and I, I wanted to see how the temporal and spatial distribution of the virus spread throughout the world. I wanted to see something dynamic, and I wanted to see. Um, I wanted to see. Uh, I wanted to see a movie. Um, so, an example of a visualization is something. This is from the Guardian, and this is a standard line chart showing the number of. Um, Cases of cases of the virus, and this this is throughout time, and it shows each of the each individual country um, through time. And here's another um, visualization again from the Guardian, and this shows um, the, uh, the, the, the the fatalities of the virus. And it, but this is this is a this is a this is a total, if you like, uh, over a whole time period. This is up to the 30th of May this year. Again, it's not showing it's not showing how the virus spread throughout the world. It's showing like a snapshot, if you like. Um, this visualization from um, the BBC website was quite, uh, was, was, was quite helpful. I will, tr I will see if that's, um, see if that's, I hope, I hope you can see that on, on the screens. That's, that's a dynamic map, if you like, a dynamic visualization. It's a movie showing how the virus is spread from each individual country and it ranks the countries. So there's a dynamic, there's a dynamic visualization there um but it's not a map it's line charts I, and i wanted i wanted to see a map i'm just going to see if i can find my um back to my slides again right uh so how was i going to do this um i wanted to build something that was open um, I wanted to use open spatial, open geospatial technologies. I wanted to use open technologies to build visualization and I wanted to use open data. So I decided to use uh, the JavaScript D3 library for my visualizations. I decided to use PHP um, for the backend um, server scripting. Um, and as for the data, I had to look around the internet for data to use. I now I ended up using data from the European Centre for Disease Prevention and uh, Control, um, they provide a daily, snap, they provide daily um, snapshots of virus data throughout the world. And this data is good um, because it's open, it's, 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 it's there for anybody to use. It's in formats that are friendly for us to use. So it's in CSV, it's in JSON, and it's granular as well. Importantly, the data is granular in that it's uh, granularized by day and by country. The data contains things like country codes, which means that I was able to combine it with other data. And I got other data from places like Natural Earth um, World Map in the shape of shape files, which I was able to, con to convert to um, uh, GeoJSON format. So let's take a look at what my uh, visualization looks like. And hopefully this is live. This is a live um, animation. So. This is show, this visualization um, is using it's using my D3 and um, uh, spatial data that I got from um, Natural Earth World Map and um, and ECBPDC data, and it's showing the spread of the data with 
um, one two days for every second, um, and it's using it's using a proportional symbol map. So it's using a bubble chart, if you like, a bubble bubbles or proportional symbols, if you like. And this is how this is how I this is what I had in my mind's eye. This is what I saw in my mind's eye, what I, the kind of visualization that I wanted to see. And um, I think it works pretty well because you can see quite dynamically how the virus has spread from China to the Middle East to Western Europe to North America and now South America. And it's uh, and the, the data is um, right up to date up until um, uh, up until today. Um, okay, I'll stop talking. That's five and a half minutes. I'll stop now. Brilliant. Thanks, Eddie. That was great. Um, haven't got any questions, uh, but really appreciate that. It was a really interesting overview. Um, and I think now we're going to jump on to the next talk, obviously, because we have to speed things up quite quickly. Um, Who's up next? Sorry, because yes, oh. I am up next. <laughs> um, is it Ruta? Is it Ruta? Yeah, it's me. Hi, Ruta. Uh, Hello. Cool. I'm starting yeah, um, to share my screen. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Good. Uh, sorry. I'm... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will swap. This is probably that I have to swap great. here. Is that good now? Yeah, that looks great. Hear me? Brilliant. Okay, yeah. great. You um, already. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, my name is Rode Skoin and I represent Evenflow. Uh, so it's a Brussels-based company leading and contributing to different studies, projects, and, and uh, business development around Earth observation and satellite navigation. But uh, today I wanted to briefly uh, introduce uh, you to Parsec Accelerator, which is one of the projects, exciting Horizon 2020 projects that we work on um, that supports SMEs and startups uh, uh, in their innovation journey. Um, and so we're not alone, obviously, there. Uh, there are nine partners, SMEs, and um, clusters from seven different countries, led by ERSC, uh, the European Association of Remote Sensing Companies. Um, and what we do, we, uh, we try to foster to help SMEs and, and startups to bring new Earth observation-based solutions uh, for food, energy, and environment. Um, so um, we do that uh, by giving, um, distributing 2.5 million uh, euros in equity free funding. And then there's a serious pack of tools and support where the business catalysts are the ones that uh, might interest you specifically as well. Um, so 2020 for us started uh, in a very nice, very good manner because we, we finished our first of all open call. Uh, we had, we received 350 applicants uh, almost, uh, and we were excited to see them um, because so he, here are our uh, winners of, of, uh, of the first stay of the first open call um, and uh, a lot of diversity of the proposed ideas, both new and confirmed uh, companies uh, joined and we were very excited to see them and to launch the first stage, but then obviously COVID happened. Um, so uh, we had to move uh, the three-day boot camp online or the networking learning co coaching which is a bit maybe more straightforward so a bit like today all our <laughs> meetings looked like this <laughs> or or different uh, aspects of the accelerator but um a bit also maybe like uh, like uh, in the today's meeting what was very crucial as we saw was um, first that the consortium and all, all its partners were still very strongly engaged into supporting continuing to supporting um, SMEs especially in these times of crisis and to keep keep the schedule uh, keep the innovation going um, and also of course the engagement of all the all the hundred parsec, all the all the uh, companies that were receiving benefits, they were very active, uh, and there still are. So, so we we are quite lucky that we can move on with the program. We had to do a lot of work to change that, but uh, but yes, it happened. Um, so now we're at the open call two. Uh, we are finalizing open call two this Saturday. Um, it's a call for consortia, so uh, two to four SMEs uh, who could have breath observation based solutions for food, energy, or environment can join. Um, one condition that is important for you to know is that um, 
the leader has to be somebody from the 100 parsec, so what I showed before. Um, so if there are two action points that, uh, that uh, I could uh, suggest you is one is that to join the Parsec matchmaking if you still feel like maybe it's, it's an opportunity to join. Um, it's via Brella network, so it's an uh, artificial intelligence based platform that can match you up with the right person. Um, and you can join it even if you don't plan on, on participating in the open call too. Um, and then the other aspect is, are these uh, three business catalysts uh, that bring the Earth's observation to a different level here. So big data toolbox, EOML galleries and Institute Data Hub. Um, so whether you join Parsec uh, or not, uh, these three tools are still already available. Uh, you can uh, and they all, um, especially the Institute Data Hub, uh, it's also a, a tool that helps, that brings uh, a lot of open source data together in one platform. Uh, big Data Toolbox, it's more for uh, big data processing and then EOML Galleries uh, provides access to Earth Observation Marketplace. Um, so all these three tools are already available and uh, I suggest you you can check them out if you're more interested in, uh, via our website. If you want to follow the project, there's the QR code here that leads to the, our newsletter where you can sign up to follow. And if you have any questions, I could answer, try to answer at least them uh, now as well. I think that's it, uh, five minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks, Rita. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I like the name too, it's a, it's a cool name. <laughs> 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 Parsec, it's a good name. Um, so yeah, uh, unfortunately, no questions. Uh, we, we haven't really got time anyway because it's the lightning talks. But yep. yeah, really appreciate you your help with that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next up, we've got Andrew. Just trying to find him. Hello. Sorry, Andrew. I'm just uh, while well, you're there, you're all ready to go. All ready to go. Just share my screen. Uh, Okay. Uh, thanks, Matt, for the, um, setting this all up and, and running this meeting. So basically, um, information today about satellites is just too hard to find. There are too many pixels for uh, an analyst to look at. Um, there are just hundreds of projects um, done on a company basis or an individual basis. Kaggle is bringing us whole new audience to the geospatial sphere. We're very fortunate in the sense that satellite data is really well structured and lends itself to a lot of machine learning. But, but if I wanted to leave you with one piece of information before I drop into this presentation is to say that one image isn't cool anymore, it's 10,000 images or 100,000 images or even a million images. And what I want to talk about is how do we go out about finding information about Earth observation and, and projects and code related to it. So this, um, this idea, a bit like um, Eddie's in the, in the first talk, came about from uh, this lockdown period where we had a steam from above um, lunchtime conversation about projects on GitHub related to Earth observation. And the consensus began to build saying, Oh, I knew, I knew this, I, knew, I, I know something about that. But there was this n lack of community um, awareness, a lack of collaboration. And it, it comes down to as simple as almost sharing links between each other. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a pretty much a given, but for those who are not aware, we are in an unprecedented age now of, of satellite data. So we're looking at huge volumes of launches. This is... Um, an infographic that I've taken from the Radiant Earth Foundation's um, infographics sheet. So the link is link is below, um, and we we've gone from uh, 26 in the previous decade to 594 satellites um, being launched now. And this was in 2017. And even today, in in this uh, reduced economic activity, we're still seeing launches. Just 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 last night, we had some more doves being launched. The day before, we had some more SkySats. There are more and more data sources coming out there. And Earth observation is beginning to move away from this idea that we're just not a base map. We're not an academic thing that sits in the background, but with a, with a foundation and, and fundamentals for a very diverse, uh, multi-purpose business environment. And I think 
as a community, we need to we need to embrace this more. But why is it that it's so difficult to find the most basic information about remote sensing and, and maybe even you could say geospatial, such as I'm trying to find a list of commercial satellites, but I feel I feel the information is there. I'm pretty sure I've seen it before, but where is it? These questions are coming from people who are quite senior in our industry and answers coming back from, from people like Stephen Ramage, who, who works for um, the group on Earth Observation saying, I know the feeling, you know, where is this information? And this is a kind of itch that, I, that I'm beginning to want to scratch. And I, I, I find this frustrating. And this is a barrier to entry for, for people joining um, and wanting to investigate more into Earth observation. And this is, this is where this uh, awesome Earth observation code idea is really sort of its foundations have come from. So, so where is this information? So from a, from a personal point of view, as a freelancer, I'm interested in, is there any related Earth observation code to what I'm trying to do? What are my problems I'm trying to solve? What is the state of the art? You know, something that's happened five years ago versus what's happening today. And how, how can I contribute? How can I make progress? So, so where is all this information? And I think, you, you know, there'll be people on this call who are, who are developers in the open geospatial community. And I, I thank you for, the, for, for all the contributions, but you don't have to be a developer to contribute to, a, to an open community. You, you can just share some cool links. And I'm just gonna step into the um, awesome Earth observation code in a second and show you that we've, we've now got quite a vast range of, of links related to projects. And it's not just Python, although there is a lot of Python, it's, but there's YouTube videos, there's um, code from R, which is a, you know, an increasingly important language. There's JavaScript, there's Java. There's, there's lots of information out there. And it's a, group, a great place to start. And in the 63 days since we've started this project, um, or I've, I've started this project, I've had 20 contributors and I've, just that just really delights me that more and more people are sharing information and putting links in we've got almost 400 unique resources on on the um on the github repo um and of which about 76 percent of all resources are git git accounts so that's quite a huge contribution and trying to pull these all into one place i think has been very valuable to the to the extent that um philippe um sent me this link saying just because you um posted my link my my work on your earth observation code i had a massive spike in um sessions looking at looking at my uh, looking at my project so with that being said let's have a quick look at earth, uh, awesome earth observation code and it's just a work in progress and, it, and it's really open to contributions and we're, we're doing it under the banner of the scene from above podcast so please do check that out as well but basically we've got a huge, a huge array of, of coding resources that you can dive into. So whether you're interested in Python programming or R or, you know, things about training and then even getting into sort of more specifics like LIDAR and SAR and looking at code competitions and also looking at other, other, other non-geospatial information that's contributing to this community. So I just, I just wanted to sort of wrap up by saying this is this is an unprecedented time in Earth observation and, it, and it's growing. And it's, as I said at the start, there's too many pixels for us to look at. Hundreds of projects out there is, as evidenced by, by this um, awesome Earth observation code um, repo that I've put together. If you're, if you're interested in this, please, please do go and check it out. Um, if you've got any links in here that you, that you want to add, let me know. Um, and I'm just going to, leave it there i think thanks very much thanks andrew that's brilliant um i guess people can get the link online or if you want to share it in the chat quickly as well absolutely that might be great um cool uh no questions again um oh someone actually stefan keller just said should definitely mention opengeohub.org open geo hub yeah maybe that's related to different talk sorry <laughs> uh can you see the chat i can yep um, stephen keller 
Yeah, I'm not aware of Open GeoHub. I'm aware of the Open EO project, though, that's connecting um, uh, an API via R and, Py and Python and JavaScript to various different um, resources. But I'll, I'll definitely check that out. And, and if that's relevant, I'll definitely put it on. So thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Cool. Uh, next up, we have uh, Sruti. Yep, I'm here. Let me just share. Hi, Sruti. I'm going to pronounce that correctly. Okay. Um, Ready when you are. Great. Let me oh. just make this full screen. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shruti Modakriti. I am the um, platform lead at OpenAQ. We are a uh, US-based nonprofit um, and I'm currently based in California, where it is very early in the morning for me. Um, but really excited to be here with everybody. Um, yeah, let me, uh, let's dive right into it. Um, so air pollution is uh, one of the biggest uh, public health and human rights issues of our time. Uh, it causes, it causes uh, one out of every eight deaths on the planet, um, and the World Health Organization estimates that over 90% of the world's population uh, li uh, is breathing un unhealthy air. Um, in addition to the very real challenge of the actual air pollution, um, air, air quality data um, has uh, its own unique set of challenges. Um, often, some of the most polluted areas um, lack uh, uh, lack access to air quality data, um, and there's often the places that do have uh, air quality data. Um, it's often in an inconsistent and temporary uh, format, and this prevents uh, civil society from taking adequate action to actually improve conditions in their community. Um, and this is kind of where OpenAQ comes in. Uh, we're trying to build an open uh, data infrastructure so that we can enable the work of uh, people from all different sectors so that they can focus on the work that they know how to do best and, um, and don't, you know, don't have to spend hours transcribing uh, PDFs just to get some data. Um, and they can get that data very quickly and easily and um, for free. Um, so the OpenAQ platform currently has um, almost, or sorry, over half a billion data points um, from over 100 sources from almost 100 countries. We're almost there. Um, it's completely open source. You can check it out on GitHub um, and uh, you can check out the website op at openaq.org. Um, and it's uh, the back end is um, run on Amazon Web Services. It's written in Node. And the way it works is it basically grabs um, data from various uh, government sources around the world every 10 minutes, uh, puts it in the Postgres database, um, and then also on Amazon S3. Um, and then the data is accessible through an open API um, and also through like direct download options uh, based on your like technical um, expertise and uh, what you're trying to do with the data. Um, and the other great part of OpenAQ is the community. We have like a very diverse uh, group of people, um, over 800 people uh, in the Slack uh, as of this morning. Um, and we've seen like really awesome uses for uh, use cases for the, the data. Um, for example, like NASA has used it for uh, air quality forecasting models. Um, on the right, you can see Smokey, the air quality bot. Somebody like used it, um, air quality data to um, make it easy for people to understand what's happening in their community. Um, and it's not just people uh, using the data, but also like contributing to the platform. Uh, we've had people from all over the world um, contribute uh, to the platform and, and bring it to where it is today. Um, and so one of the requests that we've often gotten from the community is um, to make it easier to analyze the data. And so this is where the, the, the motivation behind creating an averaging tool came from. Um, there are a lot of use cases um, where most, you know, most people don't really need um, uh, data uh, from every single station in the world for every hour. Um, it's easier for them to just be like, oh, what is the air quality in like London right now or like for the past month or for the past year or something? Um, you know, one use case is, um, you know, taking the air quality data and overlaying it on top of like COVID-19 projections like um, Eddie, Eddie had shown. Um, and so 
we created, uh, we added an endpoint to our existing API. We're in the process of adding the endpoint, uh, which will make it easy to uh, calculate the average uh, air quality um, over various spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, and I will show you a preview of the tool. It's still in the, still a prototype, as you can see, um, but we'll be releasing it in the next uh, few weeks. Um, so here, um, you know, it's just, the endpoints averages and you can see that um, you get by default the um, daily average um, by um, station. So this is one station, US diplomatic post um, Bamako, um, different one here. Um, but this isn't that useful. Like let's say we want to look at the monthly averages for the city of uh, Paris. Um, you can have a query where you say city of Paris, um, temporal is month. Um, and then you can very easily get uh, the monthly average for the city of Paris um, and also get some statistics like the number of measurements that went into calculating this, um, this average. Um, and you can, you know, you can see each month and, and it goes back all the way to um, 2017. Um, and I'm just going to wrap up here by saying that um, the, uh, there's a lot of nuance to how these averages are calculated and there's like lots of different ways and we'd love to get input on how best uh, to build this tool um, so that's useful for the community. I'd love to get um, you know uh, people from the geospatial community to uh, to lend their expertise on how this could be built. Um, we also are working on a low-cost sensor platform because so far we focused on government data um, and one uh, advantage of this is that we're able to fill in air quality from a lot of regions that don't have government data available. Um, and we would love to hear from you and for you to get involved. Um, you know, reach out to us via GitHub, through email, Slack, um, tweet at us. We'd, uh, we'd definitely love to uh, hear from you and for um, more folks. Thank you. Thanks, Ruti. Um, I've got a couple of questions actually. Uh, we have time. Uh, so what, the first one is, do you use governmental data exclusively? If not, how do you ensure data quality? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now we're focused exclusively on uh, government data and our policy is that uh, we just share whatever government sources are outputting. Um, we have tools like open source tools that can help you do um, quality checks, um, but whatever the government source is outputting, that's what you'll see in our platform. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, from the same person, it's uh, Gurendinger asked the question. They say uh, also when air quality in when you say air quality in London, isn't there a problem regarding the low amount of measurement stations? So it's a rough estimate instead of a reliable index. Yeah, that's true, um, and uh, that's why there, there are a lot of caveats to like uh, like creating an average or um, like even even when you're like looking at uh, uh, sta like station level um, air quality data because there are differences for where the stations are located and like the environmental conditions around them. Um, but it, it does give like some indication of what the air quality is um, mm. in that area. And cool. it's like something's better than nothing. Yeah. yeah, which is great and probably very different at the moment to how it would, would have been a year ago. Mm -hmm. Some real changes. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Ritu. Um,